talk about the notion or the idea of can God love you if he holds your sins in any way against you? I mean, is it possible for him to do that? So I'm addressing the issue of when he forgave everyone once for all, as it says in Hebrews 10, did he really forgive everyone once for all? And now there is no longer an issue of sin between us and our God. There's just you and your God, or is it you and then sin and your God? And then you live a life of trying to reconcile that problem by getting him to forgive you now as opposed to having been done a long time ago. So I want to address that with a couple of scriptures and also just from relating as humans, we try to forgive each other. We do, we do our best. We're talking about God's perfect forgiveness here. And really think about this. I really want you to think about this before I read the scripture. Is if he holds your sin against you at all, I mean, just he's waiting for you to get it together. He believes in you. He's going to help you stop sinning. But for right now, there's a sin issue you have. And he's waiting for you to get it together. Can he love you? Can he really love you? I just want you to think about that. I'm not going to claim to answer that question. Just But seriously, think about that. Can God really truly love you when he's waiting for you to fix something that he is going to have to then address and then forgive you once he analyzes what a good job you did in correcting it. Okay, that said, I want to go to Matthew chapter 5 from the famous Sermon on the Mount. And so you know, my wife and I believe the Sermon on the Mount was taught for a very specific reason, a very good reason, as with much of Jesus' teaching. He gave us glimpses of the new covenant but most of it is all about the Old Covenant. He had to. He was made of a woman, made under the law. So he taught the law of Moses. The very thing he was going to free us from. So he stressed the law. He magnified the law. He brought the law and full power of the law. And it's totally impossible for you or I to ever obey. That's why he said the things he said. Not so we could try harder, but so we could give up and throw ourselves on his mercy after trying as hard as we could. So, 521, this is an English standard version. It says, You have read that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Let's stop right there and read a couple more verses. But at first he says, don't have anything against anyone. Don't think it, don't feel it, don't say it. And in verse 22, he says, If you insult someone, you're liable to the Sanhedrin, the council. If you say you fool, you're, you're liable to the fires of hell, the hell of fire. And then he turns around almost like to say that, to illustrate that, see now if someone's mad at you, they're liable for hell fire. And you got to fix that to save their soul. You see what he's doing here? He's putting you in the position of Christ. You are the one that has to get them to forgive you. Because if you don't, then their blood is going to be on your hands. That's what he says in the next verse. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there, remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. First, he says, don't feel these things towards other people. Don't think them. Don't say them. But if someone has it towards you, you're responsible to fix that. You, and I know I'm getting repetitive here, but really think about this. I'm trying to make the point. You become Christ. You become God the Savior in this situation. And that is quite clearly implied in religion. I know. I've been told that I've been responsible for setting people off to hell for various reasons for my failures. 
and it's now incumbent upon me to correct that situation or else they're gonna they're gonna burn and I'm gonna be the one that caused it to happen and sometimes it's just implied but you know what it feels like if you've been in the Christian world you know that guilt has been laid on you that you're responsible for someone and that goes to the the opening question about does God hold your sins against you and if he does can he love you because here he lays this thing out like I said an impossible thing this cannot be done yet you are told every day every sermon every study every book of Christianity basically in one form or another tells you to basically do these things when I confronted and said how am I supposed to do this you mean I can't go down to the altar until I've fixed it with every human being in the world that has ought against me I mean that's what that's what it means that's what it's saying you have to fix every single thing that is not reconciled between you and any other individual in the world before you can go to the altar and offer your gift whatever form your particular religion teaches you here he's talking about an actual gift that's what they did back in the day it wasn't just sobbing or 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 chattering and gibberish or or giving your tithe offering it was a real offering so how could you do that how could you do that how could you even find all the people you've ever met and offended you probably couldn't especially in today's world even back then it would have been hard because people traveled you need to take this literally that's what he said live by the words of Jesus Christ so live by the words of Jesus Christ you must find every single person I know he gives an example of if your brother but your brother is everyone is everyone and every single person out there you've had offended you better fix it and now just to make his point to really show how impossible it is to do this because he knows what type of prideful people he's dealing with he's talking about he's talking to pharisaical Jews here verse 25 he says come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison I don't know if you ever noticed that. It used to drive me crazy. I look at that. It's like, I'm the guilty one. My accuser is the right one. In every scenario, my, my accuser is always right. And I'm always wrong. And it's always, you know, no matter what. He could have he beat me, robbed me, raped me, killed my loved one. He accuses me. He, he's now in the right. And I'm in the wrong. And I must fix it. That's what this says. Don't let them put words in here and read things into it. It's not saying in certain circumstances. It means, no, this is what it means. Your accuser, anyone who accuses you. And you know, we all know who the absolute accuser of the brethren is. We go to verse 26. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out that's out of jail until you have paid the last penny. Well, that just makes it as obvious as anyone can see. You're not going to get out of jail until you pay every last penny. Well, how are you going to pay every last penny when you're in jail? You can't earn any money in jail. He's just, he's almost, I know a lot of people say it's sarcasm, and I wouldn't even so much as deny that, because God is kind of winking and, and smiling at us and saying, you know, you just, you are, you're hard-headed. I love you guys, but man, you're really hard-headed. You really think you can do this stuff. Okay, you want to do everything I say? Well, here it is. You're going to go to jail, and you're never going to get out until you pay the fine. And we look at it and we go, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Let me uh, let me do a few mental gymnastics and I can make that work. Oh, yeah, I'll never go to the altar until I make it right with every human being I've ever found. Sure, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. You know what I'm saying that is? Well, it's called modern-day Christianity. That's what it is. That's what everyone convinces themselves to believe, or in my case, what I chose to do was just ignore it and avoid it. I look at it every so often and cringe. I, would, I learned after that first time not to ask any more questions because there was no answer there was no answer in the framework of Christianity because the simple fact of that the matter is, is if that's true in your relationship with your God then he doesn't love you and he can't love you for anyone to hold their sins against you they can't love you like you need to be loved we can't love each other the way we need to be loved only God can do that that's what this illustrates it illustrates there's only one that can love you the way you need to be loved. Yeah, it's great getting human love. It is. It's awesome. It's neat. And it's just human love. It's just that. It's imperfect. And sometimes, every so often, we can receive his love and we can share that with each other, his love. But the point he's trying to make here and teach to these prideful people is that it can't be done under your own will, under a command. I can't command you 
Moses can't command you. Jesus can't command you. And then you say, okay, I'll do it. I'm going to do it. I promise. I'll do it. You commanded me to do it. I'll do it. I'm going to make it right with everyone I've ever offended ever in my life before I go down to that altar. It's not going to happen. We need to wake up to the reality of what's going on here. Your God does not hold your sins against you. He can't. If he did, he wouldn't love you. That's the whole point. He took your sins away because he loves you. Not so he could love you. In a way it did. It's like that because technically if he's thinking about all your sins all the time and getting you scrubbed clean by your behavior and fixing yourself, then he never really could love you. So he just took it away. He didn't ask your permission. He didn't give you a series of rituals to do so you could fix it and then come under his good graces. He simply took them away so he can love you perfectly. And you can receive that love once you believe that he actually did that. But you're not going to fix it with everyone. It's not going to happen. Look at this for what it means. It means that you, under the law, are an impossible situation. You, under grace, who is Jesus, that is the person of grace, your God and Savior, your Lord, your everything. You, under grace, are complete. You're whole. You're loved. You're accepted. You have everything you need. But under law, you're hopeless. And you have two options. You can know what an utter failure you are and your God is disgusted with you. Or you can convince yourself by lying to yourself that you're actually doing these things and be filled with pride and contempt for your fellow man and look down on them and be judgmental and hateful. Those are basically two choices. I chose the former. A lot of people I, I saw around me were saying they felt like utter failures. I knew a few that were prideful and looked down and had contempt on their fellow man. That's the only choices in that because it's unreality. It can't happen. Don't choose that. Choose to believe in the truth that your God does love you and he can't hold your sins against you. He doesn't want to hold your sins against you. He just wants to love you. He just wants you to know that he loves you so that you, you can have that relationship and you can stop trying to do all these religious things to please him or anyone just rest in his love and then you'll find out you can start to love in a way you've never known before in jesus name